In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. A couple of weeks ago, I had the good fortune of, uh, I think the term is hanging with our Goyans, you know, our young people. And uh, we met here on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, their plans for an outing was kind of fell through, but we still met here for a prayer service and a little talk. And we prayed the ninth hour, beautiful service of the church at 3 p.m. Orthodox Christians gather either at home privately or in churches to do the ninth hour prayer. And the Goyans themselves were the readers, the chanters, the choir. It was beautiful. I, there are not too many more beautiful things than watching our young people worship, especially when you participate, when you see them participating in that worship. It's a beautiful thing. And this is one of the reasons why I have chosen for the fall study course to study the, the divine liturgy, to see what's going on behind and in between the lines and uh, hopefully with, with, with the thought of getting participation so that we can get something more out of the liturgy rather than just being spectators. So anyway, it was a beautiful sight to see. After we talked, uh, after the service, uh, I was dismissing the young people, and there was a little wisp of a girl that came to me after. And she spoke to me because of uh, one of the things we spoke about during the ninth hour after the service. I talked to them about the gospel lesson for the next day, which was the raising of the widow's son at the gates of Naim. And uh, she asked me, we sat over there in the corner in front of the icon of the resurrection, and she asked me, why do people have to die? And uh, you know, she was pretty well versed on ancient mythology of, of stories on death and resurrection and new life and things like this. But she wanted to talk to me about it. And so I gave her the church's perspective on dying. I told her that death was not the original intent. When God placed Adam in paradise, there was no decay, there was no corruption. There was perfect union between man and God and even nature. There were no wild animals, you know, threatening to kill you at every turn. It was, they were just, everything was tame. Everything was in union. There was no aging process. Man was not subject to corruption and decay and death in paradise. But once sin entered the picture, everything changed. And so that we may not live in this fallen condition of sin and disease and aging and hurt and pain and struggling with who knows what and strained relations, everything. It's just to, to, so that this life this fallen, graceless life would not go on forever. God, in his love, allowed there an end to this life. He put a cap on our immortality, and he let it, this life be mortal. Our bodies, as they are now, are not fit for forever. And this is why Christ became man. He came down from heaven, to fix the death problem, our greatest foe. And he did so by facing death right in the face. He went and died and went into the world of the dead. He trampled upon death. And I was, I was telling her, I was saying, look right in front of you, that icon. You see Christ in Hades, lifting up Adam and Eve, trampling upon death, breaking its bars, and its gates and everything that had man trapped until that time. And he became the first fruit of the dead. And he, laid, he led a path back to paradise for man. But now how does this happen? Today's gospel lesson 
is about the parable of the sower and the seeds and the soil. And because it's a parable, everything in the story means is representative of something else. The sower in the story, Christ himself tells us, is he himself. He is the sower. Christ is the sower of the seed. The seed is the word of God that he spreads on the different soils. And the four different soils represents the souls of men, the, di the disposition of men. Some are rocky and hard path and you know hard to get through, no roots, the thorns, the, the thistles, hard to, you know, easily distracted, these kind of things. But then the fourth soil represented those who were able to listen to the word and be changed by it. But today I would like to, uh, in light of this girl's story and talk with me, I would like for you to look at that seed as if it is us. Look at that seed as if it is uh, us at our death. Yes, our bodies are like a seed that is sown into the ground. It is sown in dishonor, yes, but it will be raised in glory because of the work of Christ. It is sown in weakness, but it will be raised in power. It is sown in corruption, it will be raised in incorruption. It is sown a natural body, but it will be raised because of the work of Christ, a spiritual body. St. Paul had a hard time convincing his parishioners in Corinth. It was a difficult parish, I guess. And uh, they didn't even believe in the resurrection. Some were asking, how are the dead raised? With what body? Look at the body that's happening to it. What, what body are they being raised to? Paul responds, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. Look around. Doesn't nature itself display this? Plant life shows us that death is necessary to perpetuate life. How did Christ himself put it? Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. There's death and resurrection happening, happening around us every day. For those who have eyes to he, uh, he, uh, see and uh, hearts to perceive. Our bodies that are sown into the ground like a seed follow the same process. They are sown into the ground like a seed, and after death and decay comes new life. On that last day, our resurrected bodies will reunite with our souls. It will become a body that is similar to Christ's resurrected body. His, his resurrected body gives us a clue at what our resurrected body will look like. According to St. Gregory of Nyssa, our bodies will be light and airy, able to pass through walls, yet still able to be touched. Physical, yes, but they are infused with divinity. Able to eat, even. I don't know. It, it, when Christ first appeared to the disciples in the upper room, the gospel goes through painstaking uh, process showing us that the doors were closed. It says it twice. The doors were closed, and Christ appeared to them. And he even said, do you have anything here to eat? And he said, handle me, touch me. I am not a ghost. I even have the scars. Go ahead. Our bodies on that last day, according to a few sources, are going to be a version of us in our prime. Some sources say around the age of Christ himself, around our early 30s, perhaps 33. I don't know if that's dogma, but it sure is a, a theological opinion out there. Will we be recognizable? 
with our resurrected bodies? You know, I think perhaps at first, maybe not. First of all, it's too much of a shock. You're not expecting it. Um, but perhaps after an experience, after a relational experience, after seeing the character and the essence of that person, they will be recognizable. Remember, when Mary Magdalene went early in the morning to uh, anoint the body of Jesus, the tomb was empty. And she saw someone there and in the garden said, uh, Sir, and she just, it says, supposing him to be the gardener, Sir, can you tell me where you've laid him? And he said one word to her. He said, Mary. And she recognized him. I wonder, our departed loved ones, perhaps if they just say our name, the way we know we heard it all our lives. Mary, whatever your name is, that in itself will be, become recognizable. In conclusion, our bodies on this side of life, tired by labor, diseased by worry, aged by the fall, are but a seed that will be placed in the earth. Our bodies are a seed for the bodies to come. As your priest, as your friend, as a father, my concern for you, and for myself for that matter, is what kind of seed is being planted? What crop will be produced from our seed? If what we are today is not in the likeness of Christ, then we have some work to do. We have some repentance to do. We have some confession to do. There should be a certain saving self-dissatisfaction about ourselves. Let me conclude with this. Just last night, I caught the tail end of a documentary about Vince Lombardi, the famous coach of the Green Bay Packers. Uh, one of the most successful coaches in the history of the NFL. I mean, the Super Bowl trophy is named after him, the Lombardi Trophy. Football players want this thing. And they asked him, when he was on this side of life, being successful, are you ever going to be satisfied? He said, no. I'm doing everything I can here to attain a greater happiness beyond. My friends, either, either way, good or bad, whatever your seed is at this time, on the other side of life, we will live forever. But what will your forever look like? God bless you today.